Hello there, students. Today, I'm going to be going over how electrons move in atoms. We've learned all about atomic structure, so that's the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. You've learned that electrons orbit the nucleus, and today we'll learn about how specifically that works. Uh, we'll learn a simplified version and then a more complicated but accurate version, as well as what types of things that atoms do and how we can observe uh, that behavior in the electrons. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about and trying to explain how electrons move within atoms and the observations that we make of uh, samples of matter, samples of atoms, that would lead us to believe these. And it used to be that scientists would think that while electrons were orbiting the nucleus that they could orbit at any distance. And so according to that model, however, with the electron being negative and the nucleus being overall positive because of the protons, the electron would slowly spiral into the nucleus until it crashed and emit energy as it got closer. And that, of course, does not happen because then all atoms would be annihilated. It wasn't until somebody developed an idea of what they thought that atoms could look like or how electrons would move within atoms, and that person's name was Neil Bohr. And so his idea, his theory, became known as the Bohr model. And his model explained why electrons don't just spiral into the nucleus. It also explained why when certain atoms or certain elements, atoms of the elements, uh, are heated or electrified, that they then give off light, but not a continuous spectrum of light, only light in specific colors. The Bohr model ends up being not completely accurate, but it does a good job of explaining a lot of the things for high school level concepts. This is a simplified diagram of a Bohr model. And Bohr said, just like others before him, that the nucleus with the neutrons and protons and therefore most of the mass of the atom is centered in the middle. What Bohr came up with though is that he said electrons could only orbit in certain rings or energy levels or shells were all different things that different people referred to them. So an electron could only exist in one shell or another and not in between. And therefore with this innermost shell, the electron could not spiral in and collide with the nucleus. So this was known before, that the center of the atom, the nucleus, contained the majority of its mass because it contains protons and neutrons, which each have a mass of one atomic mass unit, while electrons have a mass around one two thousandth of that. The center, the nucleus, also is positively charged because it contains protons, which are positively charged subatomic particles. What was different with the Bohr model compared to what came before it, the Rutherford model, is that electrons, though they orbit the nucleus, and people knew that before, the electrons could only orbit in specific orbits or shells or distances from the nucleus, uh, sometimes called energy levels. In addition, Bohr was able to calculate how much energy was associated with each shell. That can be seen in this diagram here. So if the nucleus were a tiny point here, this would be the first energy level, the first shell. This would be the second shell or second energy level. This would be the third, fourth, and fifth. These were the equations that he used, where n is equal to what number shell that is, 
starting with zero being the nucleus. And so this would be the first shell, second, third, fourth, fifth, as you move out. And that the energy associated with that is how much energy an electron would give off if it became part of the atom and landed at that shell. And so negative 13.6 electron volts is an amount of energy divided by n squared would give you the energy associated with that shell. Now another piece of the Bohr model was that each shell, each energy level, could only fit a certain number of electrons as a maximum. And so the N, recall that it refers to which shell it is, with one being the one that is closest to the nucleus. That can fit two electrons max. The second shell could fit a total of eight. The third could fit eight. The fourth could fit 18. Another thing that Bohr said for his model of atoms was that an electron could jump from one shell to another by either absorbing energy, which would mean that it would jump to a further shell out, and that could be absorbing energy, whether it's electrical energy, heat energy, or light energy, to jump from an inner shell to an outer one, or it could give off energy by jumping from an outer shell to one that is closer to the nucleus, an inner one. And it would give off energy. The energy though that is given off, though the absorbed energy could be in terms of electricity, heat, or light, the given off energy is always going to be light of a certain color. Ground state is when all of the electrons in an atom are packed as close to the nucleus as they can be following the shell filling rules. So for instance, if an atom has only two electrons, its ground state would be when those two electrons were in the first energy level, the first shell, because they can both fit there. If something had six electrons, its ground state would have two electrons at the first shell and the remaining electrons, because they could all fit in the second shell, would be uh, there. If an atom had 12 electrons, you would have the first two electrons as close to the nucleus as they could be in the first shell. Then the next eight would be in the second shell. And then the remaining two would have to be in the third shell for it to be ground state. Excited state is the opposite, where the atom has gained energy, whether electrical heat or light, and at least one electron has jumped further out. And so for example, we'll look at hydrogen, Remember what these numbers mean. The one means that there's one proton. The one is the mass number, so it means that in the nucleus that there is only one thing, which means it has to be the one proton. And the zero for the charge means that the number of protons and electrons in this atom are equal. And so that also means one electron. 
Here's the nucleus with the one proton. I'm going to draw dotted lines to represent the different Bohr orbits that the electron could be in. With the electron being in the first energy level, this would be ground state. If it were to absorb energy, the electron could move out to this shell. It could also absorb so much energy it might move out and skip this shell to another one or one further out still. And since it needed to absorb energy to jump out to here, if it were to fall back in and go back to ground state, it would emit energy as a color of light. Another important piece of the Bohr model is that an electron could only absorb an amount of energy that would correspond to an actual jump. And so back to this, these are the amounts of energy that relate to these shells here. They're shown here as circles, but they're shown here just as lines. They mean the same thing. So this line is representing this shell and it's representing its energy level. And so what this means is that if some light were shine on this hydrogen atom and the light was a certain color that only had an amount of energy to get the electron here, the electron would immediately fall back down. It wouldn't absorb that wavelength of light. It wouldn't absorb that photon of light. It would only absorb a photon that could get it up to here or if it were here, it could absorb a photon that would get it up to here. And so it wouldn't absorb all light, but only specific colors of light that could get it here, 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 etc. And that really was what helped Bohr's model explain some things that hydrogen, when you electrify it or heat it or excite it, only gives off four or five different colors of light that you can see. It doesn't give off a whole spectrum. One last piece. Bohr's model with its equations only works for systems that have only one electron. Once you get more than one electron, things get a little bit more complicated. Um, but one thing that the Bohr model implied was that these distances, which correspond to the energy levels, these distances are different for different atoms, or sorry, different elements. And so while these distances and these energy levels correspond to hydrogen, the ones for helium are actually a little bit lower. They would be closer because the helium nucleus has more protons and can pull the electrons closer. And so all of these orbits are a little bit closer. And because it's the distance between these different things and the size of the rings, or the shells around an atom that determine what colors it can absorb and give off. If different elements, if their atoms have different size rings or different energy levels, then they therefore would only absorb and emit different colors. So this means that because an electron has to be in one shell or another, that it can only absorb or emit certain colors, and the fact that different elements have different size shells means that different elements would all absorb and emit a specific kind of fingerprint of colors. Some specific colors that others would not. All right, so this is a simulation of a Bohr model of an atom. Uh, it's 
a little bit contrived, you can see that there are a number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, but only one electron for simplicity's sake. Now the controls here, we can make it jump to different orbits. And so if I were to make it jump here from one to two, you can see the wavelength of light that it absorbed, that it's 121 nanometers, that it's in the UV spectrum, which means a very high amount of light. Whenever it absorbs light, it would be shown up here in the absorption spectrum. When I make it jump from a further out orbit to an inner orbit, it is given as the emission spectrum, the light is given off. And you can see the color of light, the wavelength of light emitted was the same as the wavelength of light that was absorbed for that jump. So a one to two and a two to one jump are different only in that one of them is absorbing light and the other is emitting light. And you can see I can do all the different options. I can make it jump from one to three now, three to one, one to four, and four to one. Now, if you look, the nanometers for the wavelength were getting smaller, and that means higher energy. So a bigger gap, like between the four and one, had a shorter wavelength, which means higher energy, than the two to one jump which had a longer wavelength and less energy. Those are all the jumps possible here for one, and you can see that they were all in the UV range. But now if we start at two and jump from two to three, you can see the amount of light that was needed for that. The photon had to have had a wavelength of 848. And when it comes back down to orbit two, you can see that it emitted the infrared light from two to four, we should see that it has higher energy and should be uh, more toward the visible spectrum. And then when it jumps from four to two, it gives off that color. The ones that are left would be just jumping from three to four. And you can see that that amount of energy was so small that it was off the chart. And so here we can see that no matter what jumps we have the electron make, it can only absorb certain colors of light and it can only emit certain colors of light. There is no way that the atom, as configured this way, could give off blue light or green light. And what we can do in this simulation is resize the rings. So I'm going to reset the spectrum. So you remember that it was three UV, one yellowish in the visible and one in the infrared. If I reset the spectrum, actually I'm gonna to go to jump one and reset the spectrum. Different elements have shells that are different sizes. And so I'm going to just resize these shells. And now do all of those same jumps, one to two, And you can see that this absorb, absorbs and emits different colors than the previous atom. And that's because the shells were different sizes, which means that it was a different element. The different number of protons in the nucleus will either draw the circles further in or will let them be further out. So this would even be a different element now. And so you can see this also. And so you can see that this also has a different pattern of absorption and emission. So the main idea is here that an atom can only absorb and emit certain colors because its electron has to exist in one of those orbits. And that different atoms that are different elements have different size orbits and therefore would have a different set of colors that they could absorb or emit.